Hi, I'm Seth Juarez, and I'm having a conversation today with Drs. Krista, Krista Spore and Nathan Wiebe, researchers at Microsoft Research, who have been pushing the boundaries of artificial intelligence through quantum machine learning. Welcome, Krista and Nathan. How are you doing? Thanks a lot, Seth. Great. Doing great. Fantastic. So, the first question is probably the most one. Uh, we've all been hearing a lot about quantum computing in the news lately. How is Microsoft working to make the dream of quantum computing a reality? Sorry, you said. Okay, great. Yeah, so Microsoft, uh, we've actually been working on quantum computing for over a decade. Uh, and we've been looking to really build and create a scalable general purpose quantum computer. We're taking a really distinct, uh, unique, bold approach. Uh, and we're working on a type of qubit called a topological qubit. Uh, which is very different than the other types of qubits being pursued, such as superconnected qubits, ion trap qubits, and so forth. And I think what the other piece about our approach that's really unique is that it's really a full stack, full system approach. So we're working on the hardware layer, the software layer, and then also, what are you going to do with the quantum computer? So the application layer. I see it. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess on the, on the application side of things, really one of the things that we've found is that quantum computing really promises to totally revolutionize the way that we approach artificial intelligence and machine learning. And the way that we, we it will do this is by leveraging quantum effects, such as entanglement and interference, to solve currently unsolvable problems in machine learning. And it isn't just actually speeding up. That the real thing that actually it ends up giving us is actually also more rich models for data than what we would normally be able to have using conventional approaches. I see. Keep going. So sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. no problem. No problem. But one of the things that actually recently we've uh, we've realized is that another area that's actually quite important and interesting for it is in privacy and security. We can actually secure training data for machine learning solutions using the very laws of physics with this, rather than trying to protect them using some expensive uh, cryptographic protocol. So, I was confessing to you beforehand, and maybe you're going to help me out, because they said I have a little bit extra time. I was in algorithms class. <laughs> The last two weeks, you know, when they do like, here's the special topics, yeah. they did quantum algorithms, and I thought, this was 10 years ago. I was like, these machines don't exist, so I'm not going to pay attention. Can you tell us what makes quantum computers different than traditional computers, Christine? Yeah, sure. So, first, it's, it's similar to a GPU processor model, right? When you think about programming a GPU or an FPGA or all of these different, you know, chips that now sit in the cloud, uh, we think about it as an accelerator. Um, so a quantum chip would be another chip in this heterogeneous cloud environment. And you would program it from your classical computer. So it's really an accelerator and it's a coprocessor model, right? So you're still programming from your classical computer and there's still a role for a classical computer, which is important to remember. And then um, the quantum computer, of course, has different instruction sets that are required to run on it. It obviously uh, harnesses the power of quantum mechanics, which is very different. And so we actually have built out a whole software framework to allow us to program a quantum computer and then you take advantage of this hybrid model. So we actually look at developing algorithms and then we can simulate these algorithms actually in our software stack. Uh, but these algorithms, we like to look at hybrid algorithms that take advantage of the quantum chip for the special subroutine that needs it. Uh, so a certain, you know, a certain computation you might ask the quantum computer to perform, and then you perform additional, you know, pre, post processing or continued processing in a in a feedback loop, if you will, uh, with the classical computer. So that's that's kind of how you can think about programming, especially in the early days of a quantum computer, how you could program that model. And that's really interesting because I feel like. We used the GPU for that just fairly recently to offload right. all of like the linear algebra, for example. Like for example, we're we're gonna do some kind of singular value decomposition, go to the GPU, it's super fast. But my 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 concern not my concern, but my question is, what kind of things will we will we be offloading to these quantum chips, so to speak, that help AI? And you mentioned like entanglement and other things, but I'm having a hard time understanding like what, what goes there and what goes in the other spot. Well, that's actually a really good question because that's something that we're beginning to actually get a better appreciation for at the moment. Because right now, we've got a big laundry list of different techniques and we're trying to figure out the best way in order to interface quantum ideas with the kind of challenges that we face in artificial intelligence. But to give you some example, one of the things that quantum computers are great at is sampling. 
So if you ever look at a machine learning problem that requires you to sample from a hard distribution, we can, we can more effectively sample from it and we can learn properties like means, variances using quadratically fewer samples from the distribution. So like give sampling that we like use Like give sampling now. is amazing for it. Um, other things, other tasks like training Boltzmann machines. We found some amazing algorithms for doing, uh, for doing that. Other uh, algorithms, now there's special case, and there's a lot of caveats that I, don't have to, that I don't have time to get into, but we can provide exponential speed ups for things like singular value decomposition in some cases. So there are actually some major improvements that we can end up getting for important tasks. So now we, let's get down to the, to the nitty gritty because you've talked a little bit about some of the things. Are there some machine learning algorithms that you've been able to already speed up using quantum computers? How, how, I'm trying to figure out how they will improve machine learning algorithms. And, and the algorithms that I learned, for example, were like decision trees, you know, SVMs, neural networks. How will they help out in that regard, Kristen? Yeah, so building on what Nathan just said, um, you have things, so we can look at algorithms like deep learning, okay. um, training Boltzmann machines, as Nathan just mentioned. Uh, perceptrons is another area we've looked at. Uh, you can look at SVMs. So you can take many of your you know, more traditional, uh, classical mm -hmm. uh, machine learning models, and we can look at uh, achieving, say, quadratic, or as Nathan said, in some cases, exponential speed ups on the quantum computer. Um, so many of these models translate over. Uh, but with that, I think a really exciting and promising direction is to say, not just can we take the algorithms we have today and run them on our quantum computer, but can we actually use something that's quantum mechanical, take advantage of you know, quantumness uh, to build better models, to get better accuracy, better performance, and what does that mean? You know, what does that quantumness mean? So, in fact, we've been looking at in recurrent neural networks, as an example, in, in small cases, we've actually simulated those, brought in quantumness to the model, so quantum terms to the model, and you can actually see that the accuracy can increase. Um, so this is evidence that really using a quantum Hamiltonian as model um, and quantum terms could actually help the modeling of you know, data um, over classical methods we have today. So you mentioned quantum Ham Hamiltonian and quantum terms, and I'm like, those probably mean something very specific. Can you help me out, Nathan? Yeah, sure, no problem. So for example, you know, let's imagine, um, let's imagine what you're looking at is you're looking at a, a Boltzmann machine. Okay. okay. So a Boltzmann machine you can imagine is just an energy-based system that provides uh, an energy penalty for, um, for, well, different configurations that you don't want for the neural network. With a, if you include quantum terms in this, what this allows you to do is this allows you to not actually give uh, energies directly to an individual, an individual configuration, but rather superpositions of different configurations. So what this allows you to do is this allows you to actually penalize quantum distributions and quantum states that describe the, the system. And this gives you some non-local effects that are very difficult for you to be able to emulate with a standard Boltzmann machine. So one of the things that we've found is by including these quantum terms in there, we can not only dramatically increase the accuracy for classical tasks, but we can actually build fundamentally new classes of neural networks that can learn off of quantum evidence. I mean, that's impressive. Is there, because you mentioned your, your our implementation has like this, the hardware and the software. Like how, what is this software? Is this something we've already built? Is it, can you talk a little bit to that? Yeah, so on the software side, we're, we're building out the full software stack, right? Everything from the high-level programming language through the compilers, the optimizers, the translators, you know, everything you need to map that algorithm down to the hardware level, um, and then actually run the machine. Right, so then you need device drivers. You have to control, you know, in the back we've been showing pictures of what this device looks like uh, on these screens. Uh, this is not your standard looking device, right? We have a lot of different boxes in the lab that need to be controlled to empower this device. And uh, that also has to be uh, taken into account in the software stack. So we actually have this full software stack that allows you to run the quantum hardware. And then in addition, uh, you know, you also want to be able to test and debug before you run something on expensive quantum hardware, sure. right? So we want to find the errors in the algorithms. We want to simulate these models, um, as we've been discussing, right, for small machine learning models on small data. We want to simulate that before we run it to 
you know, pass it to real hardware. So we can find the bugs, we can optimize the circuits. There have been cases where we've actually found huge algorithmic improvements by running it in advance, compiling it in advance, looking at the circuit, the gate operations. You know, classically we have AND or NOT, sure. XOR, things like that. Uh, quantumly, we have another instruction set, and we actually look at those sequences and try to compress it so we get faster run times. We can do all of that by you know, using the software, programming the algorithms, running it in the simulator, looking at it, optimizing it, and doing you know, a consistent loop kind of with the software layer, um, and get orders of magnitude improvement, actually, in run times. That's impressive. So effectively, these machines have their own kinds of instructions. I'm trying to imagine the interface between classical implementations, because usually when I'm doing something in a GPU, I load up a bunch of data, I say, here you go, load this up, and then I say, do these things. Is it the analogy hold for quantum computers? Fundamentally, yeah, yeah. Actually, the analogy is exactly the same. But beyond that first little level, that's where everything starts breaking down. Because in order to really actually leverage the quantum computer, you really have to take advantage of quantum idiosyncrasies. So for example, really, you can actually view a quantum, a quantum computer as a giant interference device, where you get every path that the data the could take in the processing, uh, uh, in, in the data processing, and then cause these paths to interfere with each other. And what you want to do, like waves, is you want to be able to actually get the bad outcomes and the good outcomes to have the right amplitudes so that you can amplify on that. So in many ways, it's actually about wave interference, the programming model. And so it's at a, at a micro level, it's very difficult to program. But when you take a step back and look at it through the software stack perspective, it's actually not that much different. So the code I'm looking at, I mean, what is it? <laughs> Is it like the COBOL of yesteryear? But just for, I mean, I'm trying to understand what yeah. this is like. Because in the end, we all write code. That's right. What does it look like when I'm writing these machine learning algorithms to sample? For, because it seems like you're doing, the way you're describing it is you're doing a lot of things at once and then amplifying the good and de-amplifying the bad. How do you do that in code? Well, I think part of the beauty of this is that underneath quantum mechanics sits linear algebra. And ultimately, the state vector is a vector, and our operations are actually all matrices. They're okay. unitary matrices. They have to be reversible. And so actually, in the code, what you're really writing, and, and we provide some higher level of abstraction for this, um, but you're really writing a sequence of operations, which are matrices being applied to a state vector. And so at some level, it looks, you know, it looks like you have some you know, variable that stores your state vector, and then it looks like I want, you, know, you just type the name of the operation, which behind the scenes has a matrix that represents it. Um, so you have a qubit type, and you have you know, a classical integer type, and, and so you have some different types in your system. Uh, but ultimately, you still, it, you know, it's in our language, for example, is embedded in F sharp. So it looks oh, okay. like a standard, you know, functional style language. And you take that vector, which you now write, you know, ket, uh, a quantum uh, vector we represent as a ket vector. Cool. Um, and that ket, then you can apply an operation to it. And you just write the sequence of operations you want to apply. And then on top of that, if you want to do kind of these more complex things, like you want to do something uh, like the Fourier transform, okay. uh, which you get a speed up uh, quantum mechanically, uh, you can ask uh, the library. We have a library of different um, arithmetic and scientific functions and, and quantum, special quantum functions, um, that then you can say, you know, I'm just going to type the name of that library function and apply it to my state, my system. And so it actually looks much more um, elegant, if you will, than uh, one might think uh, at the surface. That, that's, a, that's impressive, right? And it's fun that you're using F Sharp, which is a tremendous language, because I saw something, I saw something, because parallelization, for example, was one of the harder things to do, and I saw yeah. F Sharp had these sort of parallel blocks where things could just happen. Is there the same kind of blocks for, for quantum computing? You say, this part is for the quantum computer, then put the result here. Is that the kind of thing you're doing, Nathan? Well, yeah, actually, that's entirely what's going on. Because, say you take a look at um, um, training a neural network mm -hmm. using a, a quantum computer. What you would do in that particular case is you would use the quantum computer in order to find the expectation values that you need for the gradients of the weights. And so once you have that information, then you pass it back to the ordinary computer, aggregate that, and update your model stored in the ordinary computer for that. 
So actually, you can view all of that just as inside a classical loop where you're just offloading this one function saying, you know, sample from the distribution and compute the average. Mm -hmm. That part is the only thing that the quantum computer cares about. So we can really view this inside a larger classical framework that actually executes the majority of the algorithm. See, maybe I've been thinking about this wrong because I, I thought that classical machines would eventually be replaced by <laughs> quantum machines. Is that really the case? Yeah, we don't think of it quite as a replacement, but maybe augmentation, right? We're going to augment our, our classical machines and our cloud ecosystem with a quantum chip. And it's not the case that we're going to start, you know, using a quantum computer to do email or, you know, use Word or something. Um, we're going to ask the quantum computer to really do the hard things um, for classical computers. And, and it's you're just sort of offloading the things that the quantum computers are good at. Exactly. Yeah. That's awesome. So, why start with artificial intelligence? Why is that such a good target for quantum computing? Well, there's a couple of reasons why it's a it's a great target. Actually, I would say that, you know, if you take a look at the, the grand scheme of things, the first most natural fit, believe it or not, for a quantum computer is simulating physical systems. Because in some sense, the, the quantum computer is a quantum system in and of itself. So you don't have to get it to bend over backwards to address these things. But the second tier applications, the ones that are just slightly more or less removed from that, are actually very naturally artificial intelligence applications because of the fact that basically quantum computers are extremely good at two things. They can store very high dimensional vectors extremely cheaply. With 100 quantum bits, you have a vector of dimension 2 to the 100 that you're representing inside That's the system. Because right. there's like three different states. Am I remembering this right for qubits? Well, every qubit fundamentally you can is actually can be in an infinite number of states oh, at, see, at the same time. But there's basically like two components that you can view. So it's a it's a vector in R2. That's okay. unit length is one way you can think about it. And the um, the basic idea behind behind um, the the advantages are that and also give the ability to actually kind of use interference in particular ways in order to sample from distributions that would be very, very difficult to do that. For example, we can sample from Gibbs distributions very quickly using these things. So you mentioned, you mentioned this is the second time you mentioned interference. Maybe can you help me understand like what, what's actually going on, Krista, with interference? Yeah, so maybe let's take a step back and think about maybe a, a, like a tide pool or a, okay. a pool, right? You have a small amount of water and, and you put your finger in it, right? And it creates these ripples, waves, mm -hmm. right? And now, if I do that somewhere else in that pool, right, these waves collide. And in fact, when you do this, you'll note that some disappear, and some actually get bigger. Right. And we actually take advantage of this wave amplification in our quantum algorithm design. So the whole idea is to get the good solutions to amplify, and those waves to get bigger and bigger. And then the bad solutions, hopefully, you know, they interfere and actually disappear or get smaller. So we would reduce their, uh, their amplitudes. And the whole idea with quantum computing uh, and something to note around the algorithms is everything's probabilistic, right? right? So at the end, we measure the system and we get some, some result uh, with a probability, right? It's, it's probabilistically given to us. So this idea of amplification, we're amplifying these waves, we get these high waves, and we'll get one of those waves back at the end of the computation with the probability related to its height or its amplitude. And that's what allows us to sort of just do all of these computations at once and have the one just surface to the top that we want. Yeah, that's how we can kind of use it as a sieve in order to be able to get the samples that we want from the distribution and never see the samples that aren't informative. So you mentioned uh, there is a difference between our uh, quantum systems and others. You mentioned topological quantum computing. What does that mean and what makes it different? Yeah, so with the type of qubit we're looking at, uh, the idea is to really start with a much more solid foundation, if you will. So imagine you're trying to build a really tall building, and you do this on stilts. Well, you might not get to a very tall building, right? right? Depending on the goodness of your stilts. Right. Um, but imagine instead you, you know, put this really good, solid, concrete foundation, then you can build you know, to pretty large-scale buildings. Mm -hmm. So I like to think about what we're doing is building a better foundation. We're trying to build a qubit that's going to be far more robust, more scalable, um, less prone to error. It's going to be much more resistant to the kind of noise we have in our environment. And because of that, 
you know, at its core, it's just this better foundational, you know, qubit to build the whole system from. And with this better qubit, it's um, our qubit in particular is very robust to noise. It's actually encoded in a way that it's non-locally encoded. So the information actually isn't stored all in one place. It's stored in a distributed way um, across several, several what we call uh, quasi-particles. Um, but by doing this, it's more robust. And uh, we take advantage of that then. We can actually get away with um, far fewer physical resources to build a large quantum computer than you would for these other types of qubit systems. Uh, it could be orders of magnitude uh, fewer resources, you know, something, it could be up to a thousand or ten thousand times fewer physical qubits to run and build a quantum computer to run some of these, you know, very large scale algorithms. So you don't need a lot of qubits to run these types of systems, is that is that right? Well, one of the things, go, following up on what Krista was saying, that's important to, to make, make a distinction between, is that when we talk about qubits, there's two different types. There's the physical qubits that have errors, that have imperfections. Sure. And then there's the logical qubits, which are sort of the qubits that we refine using error correction out of those physical qubits. In terms of logical qubits, with 100, about 100 uh, logical qubits, we could change the world. No question about it. Uh, but in terms of the number of physical qubits, that depends on what type of hardware you're using. With the stuff that we're pr uh, proposing doing, we might be able to do something around the scale of a thousand qubits, as opposed to a few million or a few billion with other with other technologies. That's amazing. I mean, I, I remember when like two qubits were losing state ten years ago. I mean, so it's pretty cool how far we've advanced. So, what's next for you and your work on quantum computing? What's the future, Krista? Well, so we're really continuing to see what you know. What else can we uh, do with a quantum computer? So really diving into other areas of AI and ML, really looking at quantum heuristics. So you know, in the classical world, we use a lot of heuristics sure. um, in terms of things we actually run, say in Bing or mm -hmm. in other uh, applications. Um, but to run such heuristics, you have to test them on a real device. Right. And we're limited in that size right now. Um, but we're starting to look at uh, what can we do with quantum heuristics um, for machine learning. Uh, and we run that in our simulator in advance. And again, that, that plays to the role of software and how important that is for testing in advance. So we're looking at quantum heuristics. We're obviously continuing to push on the hardware and demonstrate a, a scalable topological quantum computer. Um, and we're also just looking for other great applications. So, you know, we all, we're always looking for the next big thing for a quantum computer to uh, to run on. Um, awesome. So we continue to look for great ideas there. What about you, Nathan? Well, you know, one of the things that I'm most passionate about, Seth, is that. I, I, I got to echo what Krista's saying. We're only at the beginning of actually understanding what we can do with this technology. But one of the things that I really would like to use quantum artificial intelligence for is actually to understand and design quantum computers. Quantum computers, even with a small number of qubits, are, are very, very difficult to actually understand at a micro level of sure. what's going on because of this interference property. But quantum-enabled artificial intelligences can tear apart kind of these secrets held in the quantum correlations that we have a hard time understanding. And so this actually opens up the possibility of building a virtuous cycle. With a small quantum computer, we get the ability to actually understand quantum systems, which helps us, in principle, build and design more complex ones, which gives us better quantum AIs. And so this actually could end up leading to pretty big implications across not just the software landscape, but also the hardware landscape. So we only have about three minutes left. I wanted to get into it because I'm super curious about this. What was the first thing you wrote uh, for a quantum computer, the first machine learning thing you wrote? And then tell me about like how you actually went and, and, and developed this thing. As you mentioned, there's these simulators that you're using. You also mentioned that you run it on the actual hardware, and you mentioned that you were sort of doing these cooperative systems. What was the first thing you wrote that you were just like, holy cow, this is, this is doing the right thing? Krista. <laughs> Well, I think the, you know, to be honest, the first thing we wrote were existing quantum algorithms to really test our software and see how well it worked. And then we actually used the system to improve things in quantum chemistry. Uh -huh. So these algorithms, you want to find a catalyst and make a more efficient reaction. Um, we actually were able, through the software and better mathematical bounds, to improve that algorithm's runtime by uh, several orders of magnitude, uh, awesome. namely by many degrees in the polynomial. 
conventional. Wow. Uh, which is really exciting. And the software allowed us to do that, you know, as well as better mathematical proofs, of course. Um, but, you know, on the machine learning side, I think the first thing we looked at was uh, computing distance metrics mm -hmm. on a quantum computer. So you want to do nearest neighbor, uh, you know, k-means or something along these lines, right? Um, you can, we, we actually started testing that as our first uh, kind of path into machine learning. And on that's a interesting computer. because, I mean, K means is very sensitive to initialization. Were you able to sort of suss out better initializations with a quantum computer? What was it about the quantum computer that helped with K means? Well, the main thing that actually ended up helping with k-means is the fact that quantum computers are incredible sampling devices. So what we were able to do is we were able to um, not just estimate what the, uh, what the individual distances were very effectively using es essentially quantum uh, enhanced Monte Carlo techniques, but we're also able to do a quantum search over all of the different cluster centroids in order to actually find the one that's closest, in some sense, without querying all of them. We could query actually the square root of the number that we, we required. And that was that's actually kind of neat. That, that had to be fun to, because, look, I, like I said, when I was studying these things, I was like, oh, these things don't exist. And if they did, holy cow, things are going to change. It's awesome to see how they are changing. Thanks so much for spending some time with us. We Thank are you, out Seth. of time. As quantum computers become a reality, it will be fascinating to see how they propel AI further and vice versa. Thank you both for your time today.